I'm Adam Camilleri and welcome to episode 4 of Gaming Against the Grain. This is a Warhammer 40k podcast which tries to make uncompetitive armies work. So on today's episode we will be covering listener questions. Unfortunately today we don't actually have any specific listener questions but we do have some attached to a list which I'll be doing which means I'll be doing three lists to review today and they're, they're all pretty cool or pretty good. I will be setting my goals for the 2018 ITC season so the things I want to achieve. Um, I'll be going over an event that's coming up this weekend, which is ARC 40k, which is a, a big event happening out in Melbourne. I'll be going over the Templars army list, which I'm taking for ARC, which will it'll be the first time I'm taking my Templars to a tournament. And I'll be going over my tip for competitive play, which is the two major competitive list types that you'll see out there. So jumping straight in, uh, my list, first list to review is a tower list, and uh, it's from a, a friend of mine named Josh. It starts with a battalion. He has Cadre Fireblade as one of his HQs with a Marker Light. He has a Suit Commander with four Fusion Blasters and a Shield Drone. Then for troops, he has two regular strike teams. Then he has two more strike teams with Marker Lights on the, whatever the sergeant's called, tail. Then he has uh, seven Shield Drones, a Yavara Forge World, which is a crazy Nutter River unit. Then he has a Supreme Command Detachment, and this one has another Suit Commander with four Fusion Blasters and a Shield Drone. Then he has four more Commanders with Advanced Targeting Systems and three Missile Pods each, and that rounds out that one. Then he has an Outrider Detachment, <clears throat> and this one has three units of shield drones, each one with nine of them in there. I'm guessing that's to dodge reaper points later. And then for the HQ in there, he has a cold star commander with a shield generator and a target lock. So this list is pretty good. It's almost as good as it gets for tower these days. It's got good long, medium, and short range firepower, and it's got drones for days. So it's got 36 missile, uh, sorry, shield drones, guys. And if you don't know what they do, they all have a four up invulnerable save, and they have a 5-up essentially feel no pain, so they've got a 5-up save after they take a wound. And then they can intercept wounds for any of the commanders or the Yavara in this army. So if you want to if you want to shoot at that Yavara, it's got 36 more wounds than you think it has, if you positions them right. Um, so if you're combating this list, you've really got to take into account not really where uh, the commanders and the Yavara is. You've got to take into account where the shield drones are. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a, a mindfuck for your opponent. So this is a good layered army um, with the missile commanders for backfield long range and it's got obsec strikes for, for holding objectives in the backfield or the midfield if they make it there. Um, for medium and short range, it's got the Yavara and the fusion commanders and um, I actually really like the added cold star. Now, if you were ballsy and wanted to make that cold star your commander um, or warlord so you can use the Montcar to on that Yavara so it can move in advance and get up the board quicker, that would be pretty cool. This army kind of hinges on that Yavara. If you use it well, it's it's pretty much a Death Star. Like, it could go out there and just annihilate your, your opponent by itself. But if you cock it up, it's 400 points of kind of nothing. Um, due to its limited range, you've got to really use that Yavara well to get the most out of it. And I'm, I'm assuming this list, the drones are going to be uh, used to keep the Yavara alive as it jumps around the middle of the board. And what this list kind of lacks is massed firepower for clearing hordes. Now, it compensates for that with reliability and durability because virtually everything in this um, that matters in this army has either a 4-up invulnerable save or it's a toughness 5 with a bunch of wounds or it's got 2-up armor. So it's all really high durability. And it's it's quite dynamic as well. It's got good movement. Um, but it lacks that sheer quantity of power, firepower to get through, say, you know, 150, 200 models quickly. Um, and so... What you're trading off with that reliability and durability is the risk of being outscored in early in missions, especially stuff in, in progressive missions. People can just score quickly throughout the game and then hold on and try not to get wiped. And so you could find that in a list like this, you're always chasing the lead. But to be honest, that's that's Tau at the moment. Like that's kind of, you're always kind of chasing the rabbit with Tau. But this, this list is quite strong. One downside of this is that you, most likely what I, I'm envisioning with this list is that you're going to use the, um, drones to bubble wrap things. Now, the good thing about that is that you can, uh, you know, overwatch for the greater good whatever you're bubble wrapping them with. But if you're a savvy opponent, they'll try and bait that out with something that doesn't matter and therefore try and tie units up and get them into combat and try and cut them down that way. Um, if you're versing mass melee threats, you can get overwhelmed with this, this army if you're positioned poorly. Um, like I said before, you really got to be conscious of where you're putting those drones. If you leave them out to dry in a position where they can be charged without any overwatch because if someone tries to charge something that can be overwatched by the Yavara oh, that's that's dead as shit but if you can string out 
and try a you know charge from so far away that your virus can't shoot you all of a sudden you can eat as many drones as you want without repercussions and that that's, that would be what you have to do to take this army apart is focus on the drones I wouldn't really change much about this this list. Um, my only real suggestion would be to try and get some bubble wrap in there. Now, that's a big deal because there are some lists out there. Like, I know I've got a couple of mates who like to run, you know, 18 berserkers in Charybdis drop pods and stuff. And so what they'll do is they'll drop down and they'll charge you from outside of your overwatch watch range because they'll use plus ones or they'll be blood they'll be blood letters and they'll be charging three D six plus them all together, plus one or whatever. And they'll charge you from outside that range and then they'll just butcher and just butcher, butcher, butcher. And they'll make them attack twice if they're berserkers or attack even three times if they can. And all of a sudden they'll walk through all your stuff. Now what you can do there is take a bit of bubble wrap. Um so what I would do with that is I would drop one strike unit and one shield drone and I would take 12 recruit hounds. Now recruit hounds are cheap as shit and they die like punks, but they will take those first turn threats for you. Now, if you wanted to go one step further with that, you drop the strikes. Like I said, you drop four drones and you drop a fusion um, from one of your commanders. And honestly, that's not really wasting that much. If seven won't kill what you're shooting at, hitting on twos, eight probably wasn't going to kill them anyway. So then you can take two units of 12 hounds. Now they're great for bubble wrap. And the other thing is they're fast enough to sit mid board and take objectives turn one, two. And they, that added level of bubble wrap um, mid game for the Yavara when you need it. So let's say all those drones are gone, but you still got those hounds. Bloody use those hounds to take the space of the drones. And then, you know, you've got another level of bubble wrap for that Yavara. And so that's really good. So all, all around, I think this is a really strong tower list. Um, and it, honestly, its weaknesses are pretty much inherent to all tower at the moment. So there's no really, no really much avoiding them. All right. So Josh, I hope that helped. And um, I'm sure I'm going to be facing this army at some point in the future. All right. Next up, we have a Necron list sent in by a gentleman named Chadwick Zyman. And uh, he writes, uh, so it's a Necron list. Uh, and starts off with a battalion that is Sortek Dynasty. He has a Nemesaur Zandrek, Vagard Oberon, a Cryptek, with, is his Warlord with Tenacious Survivor. Then he's got 18 Warriors, 17 Warriors, 17 Warriors, 10 Lich Guard with War Scythe, an Auxiliary Support Detachment with a Lord with a Veil of Darkness, and a Super Heavy Support with a Gorse Pylon. And he writes... Um, Deployed the pylon in deep strike. Uh, Nemesaur Zandrek, Oberon, and the Lord and 10 Lich Guard are all close to each other in a building, preferably. At the beginning of turn one, um, you'll, he's going to use my will be done um, from Nemesaur on the Lich Guard and then use his transient madness ability on them too. The Cryptek deploys in the middle of all the warriors, which is move up the field as a silver tide unit that has a 5 plus plus invulnerable save and 4 plus reanimation. Um, end of the first movement, pop Veil of Darkness from the Lord and move Nemesaur nine inches away from the enemy's strongest unit and then use Auburn's Ghost Walk Mantle to take the Lich Guard and position them three inches away from the enemy's strongest unit, giving them a two-inch charge due to the plus one from my will be done. Um, the pylon drops in and shoots something big, as it does, and the Lich Guard charge. Uh, key to the army is uh, make the enemy pick what to take out, the hard-to-take-out warrior blobs, the huge pylon, or the Lich Guard in your face. Um, he's planning to take this to a GT in June, and uh, might, which might change if the Codex comes out, which we now know it will, um, hopefully by June, but also to an RTT in February that only allows one Super Heavy. Is the pylon too much for the RTT? Uh, can I use the poised elsewhere? So I'll first I'll say this is a decent army, and the Geist Gorse pylon is probably not too strong, and it's worth every penny. Um, this has good synergy between Vargard, Zandrek, uh, Lord, and Lichgard. Um, the issues with range are pretty big here, though. It's only got 24 inches on all its shooting bar the pylon. It, and where that gets complicated is because due to not having decent uh, range shooting with a good amount of it, it can't kill screens, which makes big issues for the Lich Guard play. Um, if the Lich Guard can't charge something that's as important to them or that costs as much points to them, they're pretty much a waste. Like if they have to charge fucking scouts or conscripts or anything that's not a super elite, killy as shit unit, they're just not going to be worth it. But the great bit about that three being three inches away or and having a two inch charge when they drop in is it gives you great ability to surround models and kind of lock yourself in so you can't be shot. The issue with that is Lich Guard are so damn killy that you probably kill everything you, you bubble wrap. Um, so there's a kind of a balance there you've got to find. But there is plenty of play to be had there. Like if you were to, um, say, connect with one unit and bubble wrap another and then use all your attacks on the one you just connected with, not the one you bubble wrapped. There, there could be some plays there. This army kind of needs another threat or to put more pressure on your opponent and be more dynamic. 
the inherent issues with uh, a lot of Necron lists is a, is a big lack of mobility at the moment. It's something that they've already said that they're going to fix in the, next, in the Codex. They said that ne- of all the Codexes they've done, Necrons are getting the biggest overhaul, which is pretty exciting if you're a Necron player. So the things, some of the things I would change, I would remove the Lord and give the Cryptech the Veil Relic. So I remove the Lord altogether, which means you save another, a, uh, another CP because you're not taking another uh, Auxiliary Detachment. And then I would remove one unit of warriors and add a unit of immortals. Now, I would put that would mean the other two units of warriors I put up to 18 man each, and I would drop one lich guard down to nine. Then I add in the Gatan Shard of the Deceiver. This adds a shitload of tactical depth and a shitload of movement shenanigans that both you need to be aware of and your opponent needs to take into account. Now, one of the big mistakes I see a lot of people make when using the Catan Shard is putting using it to teleport things right into people's faces. Do not do this unless you are really confident of not getting charged and tied up all game. I played against a couple of people um, in Index 40k, and they would be taking three units of 20 warriors, and they would use a CP to get a three on the um, Catan Deceiver, and they would put 60 warriors in my face turn one. The problem was I had 160 conscripts, and I would just use... I would just be so happy to trade my unit of 30 fearless conscripts to just walk up and bubble wrap five or six uh, warriors, and they're both taking them out of the game. I'm trading my 90-point conscripts for your 200-point warriors. Done deal. So do not chuck things in people's faces unless you are really confident. The better idea I have for this is to take the mid-board, which is what is the most important play you can do in an ITC mission or a lot of the uh, missions now with progressive scoring. Take the middle of the board, you take the majority objectives and you get that points lead. So you teleport your warriors to the midfield and then you put them into firing range turn one. No matter where your opponent goes, you'll be in firing range turn one pretty much unless they've backlined completely in one of those short table edge deployments. Um, And you take objectives off them. And then, so you teleport probably at least minimum two units. So it would be one unit of warriors and and your cryptech. When that unit of warriors gets char- gets charged or gets tied up, you teleport the fuckers out with the veil, and you teleport them behind your second unit of warriors because they'll be moved up the board by then. Or if you've got that three, you can put them up there too. Um, s- another option you can use the deceiver to teleport the cryptic Zandrek and the warriors if you get that five, and then you use the veil to teleport the cryptic and Zandrek, and then you still deliver that lich guard play that you already had going. So you're not losing any viability there. You're still just adding in layers of depth. And then you got that unit of immortals that you put in, sit them on a backfield objective out of the way. If they can turn to shoot something, that's great. Um, the added benefits of this play is it pushes back deep strike significantly, which is one of the big issues you might have with that gorse pylon. Those people with all this, with all the uh, death company, with the berserkers, with the bloodletters that can charge 3d6, they ain't going to charge shit if you've positioned those warriors right. They're not even going to be able to charge anything but warriors. And if they charge warriors with their 300 point units, all the much the better. The other option that I put in there is that if you wanted to do all the changes I, I, I suggested and but don't put in the Deceiver, add six Wraiths for that secondary threat. They are an incredible target and they're very, very hard to kill. So instead of that Deceiver, you've got six Wraiths. So you teleport that Lich Guard up there or you wait a turn, wait until turn two, turn three when those Wraiths are right in your opponent's face and then you drop that Lich Guard blob on them. And then all of a sudden you've got a bit of a threat overload. You've got a bit terrifying, you know, terrifying two crazy units that are both really hard to kill right in your opponent's face. Now, as to your questions, um, is it too powerful for an RTT? Look, I don't know what your meta is like. Um, if it was an RTT with mine, the pylon's just fine. It's not, not too overpowered. Regularly, I'll see people at um, events that I go to, they'll take one super heavy, you know, one or two, not too bad. The good thing about the pylon is, is it just takes a big old shit on any other super heavy, but it doesn't kill... An amazing amount of stuff every turn. It's actually when you when you factor it in, if you're not facing someone who has a, a bane blade or something crazy killy, it's actually not that great. Um, or it it will kill one thing a turn. Garen fucking teed, it'll probably crap on one thing a turn. But if, in a six turn games, it only kills six things, and most people don't have six things that are uh, you know equivalent points to to kill back. If you know what I mean. So um, hopefully that made sense. Uh, Chadwick, I believe that's your name. Yeah, hopefully that made sense, mate, and um, hopefully I'll have some help from you there. Now, on to the third list for today, which um, has a couple of questions attached to it at the end. And I'm not going to focus on the list too much. I'm more going to focus on the questions. So it is from a gentleman named Brad T, and he writes, Hi, Adam. Here is the list I'm looking at taking for ARC for a 1350-point tournament. It's a Chaos Marine list, Black Legion, 
Not looking at this to be super competitive. Uh, the Land Raider was a model I made for this army going back to just before 8th edition landed, and I found out how expensive it is this edition. But I love the conversion, uh, but it doesn't need to stay for super competitive tournaments unless it does really well. He has in the list Abaddon, a uh, 10 man Chaos Marine unit, which is Marcus Slanesh, which has two auto cannons and a banner. He has another 10 Chaos Space Marine units, which is Slanesh, two auto cannons and a banner. 20 cultists, 10 with auto guns, 9 with pistols, um, which is what he had assembled from a previous army. 8 corn berserkers, all with chain axes and chain swords. A land raider with extra combi bolter, and 3 obliterate raiders, which are Marcus Lanesh. And he writes, With Arcanicon's modified detachments, only 1 HQ max at Baden a must, I feel. The general gameplay here is for pretty well everything to huddle up around a Baden and the Oblitz, deep strike down to kill whatever needs it most. Cultist and the Marines taking up space around Abaddon, and the Land Raider filled with Berserkers to keep nasty Deep Strikers away. Occasionally pushing the Land Raider forward as needed to attack counterattack uh, slash recycle Cultists further down the board as needed, and generally having a Blitz shoot again with a, uh, with uh, Marcus Lanesh and Veterans of the Long War as needed. Lax mobility and large tank killing. The main questions I have are going forward to a more competitive tournaments like Eightfold Path and Terracon, what can stay? what needs to be added is there another legion more suited will i ever have the chance a chance against multiple super heavies slash primarchs okay so this is a good arc list it's got a bit of everything but not a lot of anything um which is kind of what arc's aiming for and i'll, I'll go over the arc um, format a bit more and what kind of a tournament is later um so firstly the slanesh blitz are pretty top shelf and they're one of the best best unit shooting units you can get at the moment the ability to shoot twice with them and they have a profile range that's pretty much good against anything really um the land raider not so much now i'm not going to focus on this list too much like i said more into the questions and the first thing i'll say is that fucking keep the units you like dude the best thing about arc is it will give you a great feel for all the sort all sorts of units that you'll never see anywhere else and you'll never really take anywhere else but if you love how the la that land raider plays and it and feels fucking keep it same goes for any unit ever and this is for anyone ever if you like a unit keep it you will never dislike playing it like if you like it you will always enjoy playing it even if it's dud even if it's a piece of crap and the best thing about taking those units that everyone else thinks is shit and probably are shit they get underestimated a lot and they might just win you a game because they might be alive at the end to grab that last objective point so you never know okay so switching my thinking to being strictly competitive the best units chaos space marines have available for them at the moment are cultists berserkers blitz and noise marines now those are the four units that will always be good and always be worth taking now the zerkers might need a delivery method whether you want to invest in rhinos land raider if you love it or a drop pod you know either a cryptus or a death claw um, the same goes for the noise marines if you feel like they need to get up the board to get in that um that range a bit better um, and cults are just one of the best one of the best and most flexible troop choices in the game now the black legion trait is is great not because the legion is good what you get for being black legion is good but because it gives you access to abby who is amazing um that full reroll bubble plus the extra command points plus being one of the killiest things to ever kill shit is brilliant and if you want to build into that trait more, into that Black Legion trait where you get to advance and shoot. Um, I, I played around with Black Legion for quite a while. And like I said in my previous podcast, I was thinking of doing them before I switched to Black Templars, before I, re uh, I read um, the Black Legion novel. And one of the little plays I had in mind was uh, a spamming five-man chosen units with Storm Bolters. Now, they're, they're, not, they're not that expensive. They're not as expensive as you think. They've got two attacks base each, and they can put out four attacks each, and they can advance and shoot those, bolt, those Storm Bolters, um, which made them quite a flexible unit. And putting two of those in a Rhino was still pretty cheap. You got the added benefit of that Rhino to take Overwatch if you needed to charge in. You got 20, 20 attacks on the charge, and you got all those Storm Bolter shots. It's actually not shit. It's not great. Um, it's nothing to write home about, but it's a good way to fire for not a huge investment. Um, but past that, noise marines, I found noise marines kind of do the same thing but better and always get to shoot even if you kill them. But if you wanted to stick with that and you wanted to play into that uh, Black Legion trait, there's something to look into. Um, now, if you're looking for a cool Black Legion list, uh, think about how to make the most out of Abbey because that's the thing, that's what you're buying. When you're buying Black Legion, because the trait isn't the, the big incentive, you got to invest in that other bit and that's Abbey. Um, just like uh, Ultramarines, the Ultramarine trait isn't great isn't anything to write home about, but as soon as you add Gilliman into that equation, holy shit, it becomes becomes incredible. So that's how you got to factor in Black Legion, not just buying the Black Legion trait, you're buying access to Abbey. 
So now I'd be planning kind of a big teleport drop because Abby can teleport and probably want to look into Slanesh uh, Plasma Terminators uh, to double shoot and then some Obliterators. And then uh, take Noise Marines in a Dreadclaw or Rhino for chaff clearing so that you can drop closer. So first turn or second turn, the Noise Marines come down and they clear the chaff for you. And then the turn after that, the Oblitz and Terminators drop and get to the stuff you really want to kill. Now, the good thing about uh, dropping the Noise Marines then is they get to shoot once. Then you can make them shoot twice with the Slanesh thing. And then when they die, they shoot again. So you can get three shooting phases out of those dudes and before you get to the second turn of them being on the table. So they're an incredible unit. <laughs> they're always good. Um, and our backfield cultists are amazing and one of the best units, best troop units out there. They're just great. They're cheap and easy. And if you really want to play into them, um, this goes into my next point. Alpha Legion is easily the best trait for Chaos Space Marines and it's easily got the best stratagem. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much about why it's great. There's plenty of stuff written out there if you want to look into why Alpha Legion is incredible. It's, it gives you so much versatility and so much flexibility. But man, if, if you love your Black Legion, stick to your guns. Like, just keep working with that list. Keep tinkering, tailoring, figuring out where, where your weaknesses are and, um, you know, playing to hide them. So yeah, hope that, hope that helped, uh, Brad. And, um, Thanks for writing in, guys. Um, if you have any questions for me or a list you would like to have reviewed, please email them to gamingagainstthegrain1 at gmail.com. And if it's a list review, please uh, write a short paragraph about what you want this to do and what you want me to focus on. All right. So moving on, we are up to my 2018 season goals. So as you know, 2017 was pretty successful for me. I managed to crack uh, the top... 35 in the world, becoming 34th, you know, <laughs> just cracked the top 35. Um, and, you know, I won, I won quite a few events, you know, I won uh, three RTTs, I uh, won a major, technically came second in the ITC, and, you know, just generally did a, a really good job with, uh, with Guard this year. But looking forward to 2018, my first goal is the easiest one. I want to max out five ITC events with Black Templars. So that's five events that are ITC scored. Um, and yeah, that, should, that shouldn't be a problem. I could do that staying in Vic, even though in Victoria, even though I'm not planning to. I'm planning to travel a bit. I've already um, booked flights to Brisbane uh, next month, which I'm hoping to be the first um, event that I take a full 2,000 point black uh, Templars army to. And it is ITC ranked as well. So that'll be my first score for the year. Um, my next goal is to get a, a podium at an event with a black Templars primary army. So that is coming first, second, or third at one event I go to this year, no matter what it is, I don't really care if it's an ITT, if it's a 10 man or if it's a 100, 100 man event. Um, it doesn't matter. Just want to get a podium this year. I, I would love to be able to come top uh, Space Marine player in Australia. Um, I've gone back to back top guard in Australia and um, top three or top five in the world for guard the last two years. I'd love to be able to do the same with um, Space Marine. So I'd love to be able to top, come top five in the world as well. Now, this is setting a pretty huge bar for me. I'm pretty much setting the bar around about how I did this year for Guard. I'm setting the same for Black Templars, except I'm playing an army that is significantly weaker. Um, if you just look at it on paper, they don't really measure up. Guard is <laughs> so much more powerful than um, Black Templars. I mean, if I was to play Raven Guard or Ultramarines, probably it's a bit closer. Um, I still, still put Guard quite a bit above but that would be cutting the gap quite a bit sticking with my guns or sticking with black templars means i'm trying to do as well as i did this year with something that is nowhere near as good so i'm aiming high guys but um i'm aiming as i, as I mean to be like this is how i want to i'm aiming high so i um i don't know act with some self-belief act with them some guts um okay so on to my next uh topic which is um an arc event overview for those of you who don't know, um, Arcanicon or Arc is a tournament held in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and it's a really, really old. Uh, I say old is about tw it's been going for twenty years, I believe, and this will be the twenty-first year, and it's a really old, long-running forty-k um, uh, event. Um, it's not ITC, and it's not really competitive. It's a casual event. And the reason I love it is because it's at the start of the year and it's just an incredible way to start a new army. So the way I've got my Templars done is by setting this benchmark that I need a, a 1350 point army ready for ARC. And so then it sets me up for 
you know, my next event a couple of weeks later, I need to get 750 points ready for it. And after that, after that, and that. And so it sets your, sets your whole year up hobby-wise. So you, you can plan your year from ARC and uh, following it. And so many people start new armies for it. It's, it's great. But yeah, it's it's not a competitive event. And I'm not taking a competitive army to it. I'm taking a bag of dicks, really, which I'll, which I'll get to in the next section. But it's six games at 1,350 points. Now, this has a big, um, what we'd call soft score element to it, and it's divided into thirds for scoring. So a third battle, a third paint and theme, and a third sports. So being a good bloke and having a beautiful army is worth more than uh, being a good general. Now, I love this. I love it because it gives its diversity in the scene, and it's always a good thing, guys. Um 40k shouldn't just be tailored to one one set of gamers it, and the, the scene shouldn't just appeal to one set of one set of players it should be made you know as diverse as possible so everybody has something to enjoy and that's that's what i love about the victorian scene it's kind of ebbing and flowing a bit now which is not a, not unexpected with a new edition and how kind of brutal the end of seventh edition was um it kind of caused a bit of a drop off in our local scene but it's kind of getting more momentum again and hopefully arc is a, a great experience for everybody and um, we can move forward from there to a really diverse scene um now this is an event that's very very hard to win i think there's 180 players signed up this year so it is it is actually going to be possibly the biggest event in australia for this year um i just went to the cancon championships and they had um over 100 but nowhere near 180 so it's a significantly large event and it's very hard to win because there are so many variables. There are so many layers added to this event, which is one of the great things about it. It's it's a simple hobby hobby event uh, when you get to the games, but list writing is a really complex uh, challenge, and so is painting and having you know everything everything ticked off. It's a they set a really high benchmark um, for their paint and their theme and stuff, which is really cool and um, gives you such a good hobby goal to achieve at the start of a year. With like I've already covered, um, so there's three things you got to know about this. There's a comp score, which is comprised of two different things: is a which is a panel comp and a tick box. Now I'm going to pull these up and just run them through with you quickly. So it's called a what's called a tick composition. So you get a point for not exceeding these things when you write your list. So these are called tick and flick points and you earn them by simply making a list to meet these criteria. You get two points if you have zero flyers. You get two points if you have more selections of troops than any other any other category. So if you have, you know, three HQs, you can you gotta have four troops to offset that or two HQs, three troops. It's not too hard. Zero only zero to four units with vehicle. Only zero to three with monster, only zero to three with psyker, and zero to two with the fly keyword. So that that already that that's them telling you, hey, this is these are the kind of armies we want you to take. We want you to take something that's balanced that has a like I said before about um Brad's list. You want to have a little bit of everything, but not a lot of anything. And now that's kind of counterintuitive to what the competitive scene in 40k is doing at the moment, where people just find literally the best fucking thing they can find and then take as many of it as they can. At the moment, that the next next hot shit is the the Fire Raptor, which uh, is off its guts, and it's just kind of the predecessor to the Storm Raven. But um, we'll see how long that one lasts. If it's the same as anything else, it's got probably about a month left in it. Maybe when the next next FAQ comes around. Now, yeah, the good thing about this, it gives you it gives, tells you what they want you to play. It tells you how you you know. And although a lot of people don't like being told how to play, I'm really okay with it as long as it's not at every event. One or two events here, you know, maybe one every couple of months that you know give me some strict criteria about you know how they want their games to play played. And they these guys just kind of want armies on the weaker side, but they want them to be well balanced against against each other. So no matter what, you're still having a fun game. Now the the sec part of that is a panel comp, which a lot of people go. <gasps> No, not panel comp. Fucking might as well be open Pandora's box when I try and discuss the pros and cons of panel comp with my mates. So four judges please score your army using the following, um, and then they add the four totals together to give it a score out of 24. So the first one is zero points. No one in, will enjoy playing against this list, and I think this is a resub if you get this score. At one point, um, this list is overpowered, wouldn't want to face it, even with a Bane Blade or a Primarch. Um, three points. This list is slightly on the tough side, but not totally unbeatable. Five points. This list has some grunt, but definite flaws. It might just be competitive. And seven points. The ideal arc list, a list that you would like to play against or with many times. So that once again, these are just things that are just telling you how they want you to play, like and what armies they want you to bring. Now, the the third the third part of this is what's called arc forge. They've invented their own detachment for you to take. 
which I think is pretty fun. It might be actually like for, for themed events and for fluffy um, casual gaming. I think it adds a lot of flavor to give people their own um, detachments. Like just kind of put your little spin on it. And this one's pretty much, it's pretty much a carbon copy of a CAD detachment from last edition. So it's one HQ, minimum two troops. And then you got the option for up to five troops, up to three elites, three fast attack, two heavy support, one flyer. So you, when you factor all these things in, you pretty much get a good idea of what they want you to take. Now, that's a big reason for why this is such a hard event to win, to get all those things right um, and then have a strong enough army to win all your games, have be a good enough bloke to get good sports scores and have a beautiful and gorgeous army to get good paint scores. You see why... At the end of the day, this isn't a competitive event. This is not something you walk in taking super serious, going, I'm going to go smash face. This is mine to win, blah, blah, blah. You just literally, you go into this to roll some dice, talk some shit, and see some, see some mates. And that, that, that's, that's the best thing about ARC. It, it brings a lot of people together from different parts of um, Australia and just chucks them all in a room and just takes all the, the super competitiveness out of it and just says, hey, guys, just fucking roll some dice. Um, all right, so moving on to my arc list. So this is what I've decided to take to this event. And first and foremost, this list is far from competitive. Um, this list is literally just what I felt was realistic for me to get painted with the scheme I was doing and the time I had available. So before, over the last three, probably about the last six months actually, I've been doing event after event after event after event. Most of my weekends, I've been going to events and if I'm not going to events, I'm catching up on quality time with my partner and we're going and doing stuff. We're going, you know, picnics or we trips away, or weekends away or whatever. So I haven't had a huge amount of time to make this list and to paint it. So I've decided to go with quite an elite army and it starts off. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm doing that arc forge thing. So only one HQ, two to five troops need to have, and I'm doing the tick box as well. So I need to have more troops and blah, blah, blah. So this army um, meets every tick box requirement. So it ticks every box, uh, meets the arc forge requirement, and I'm thinking it's going to get at least a five, maybe even a seven on the panel comp. So just saying that right there, it means this army is pretty shit com by competitive standards, but I'm, I'm fucking excited by it anyway. So it's got HQ choice. It's, we've got Hellbrecht as my HQ because he's a boss. I needed a beat stick. Um, his rerolls are amazing, and his plus one strength is also fucking legit. Um, then I've got four troops. Uh, I've got two Crusader squads with multi-melters, <laughs> uh, plasmas and combi plasmas, and also got power swords on their sergeants. Now I've got two of those squads, and they're going to go in a drop pod for um, eh, kind of average to decent alpha strike unit. Um, my other two squads are six-man Crusader squads with close combat weapons, and I've got dual lightning claws on the sergeants. Now they go in uh, the land raider with Hellbrecht um, for rerolls and strength five, which makes them semi good combat units. Not great at anything really, but just more annoying and they're decent counter punch. And then I've got five assault terminators with thunder hammers and storm shields. I really loved the Forge World um, Black Templar storm shields and I just fucking had to use them. But the unit is far too expensive. But actually, it's really paid off for me for being a distraction for my opponent and can throw really throw off a whole army's fire if i'm rolling I'm rolling hot and they can you can just see the dismay on your opponent's face when they shoot almost their entire army of these guys and the storm shield just bounce it all um or you only lose like one or two guys but still they're far too expensive and they're far too slow then i've got a land dreaded crusader because i'm playing black templars and it's awesome I love the 16-man transport capacity. I love how much DACA it's got. I love that I can give it four rerolls to hit. And yeah, then the next I have a Thunderfire cannon because I wanted a, a way to actually bank on getting good stratagem use in the game um, because I actually think a stratagem is pretty amazing and it sits on an objective and I've played about, I think I played about eight games with my Black Templars and it's, it has yet to die. It sits on an objective all game and just out of line of sight and just shoot shit. Um, the stratagem's really, really good, and it's definitely going, it's something I'm going to be taking forwards in my other lists because I actually I rate it really high, um, just for putting your opponents putting your opponent off, and um, just fucking with them. Um, then I've got a drop pod, um, which is it's it's overcosted, 83 points for a drop pod when a rhino is harder to kill because it has more wounds. It has a, has probably better shooting when you can take I think you take two storm bolters on it. Um, Plus, it can charge stuff. It's good for screen. Takes Overwatch for you. Yeah, and it's cheaper. So rhinos are just 
it's so much better than a drop pod, but I'm taking it anyway because I wanted the model and I actually quite love the utility of it. Um, overall, it's a very meh army, um, but it, it's actually made with future expansion in mind. Um, it's made so that it's, it's an easy way for me to get to 2,000 points quickly after this. Um, and past that, it's just units I wanted to paint. Like, I've got Cataphracty Terminators converted up to be my Thunderhammer Stormshield guys. They look amazing. And um, I was really excited about that conversion, which is why I went with it. It's it's still got meat on the bone. Like, I've got a half-decent Alpha Strike. I've got half-decent Command... Uh, sorry, uh, Combat Units. I've got half-decent shooting. It's half-decent everything. Not good at anything. <laughs> but um, it's it's made to get the best out of the comp and hopefully sports as well. Like, so I've played... Like I said, I've played eight games and it's it's gotten rolled a couple of times, but the majority of the games, I'm, I'm in it up until about turn three or turn four and I just start running out of dudes by then. So in, I'm hoping they've got some progressive scoring missions that I can just outscore my opponent and then try and survive on and kind of just play keep away on like my Thunderfire cannon and pray he's still there at the end of turn six. Okay, uh, moving on to our final topic for today, which is the two main competitive army types. Now, this is just my opinion. There might be three, there might be 73. But from my point of view, there's two major types of competitive armies. There's all comers and there's skewed. Now, um, for those who don't know, an all comers army is a list designed for with all armies in mind, all other army types like full shooting armies, deep strike armies, alpha strike, beta strike, horde, and all mission structures. So they're designed with you know ITC missions in mind. They're designed with ETC missions in mind. Progressive, Maelstrom, Eternal War. You know they're designed to play in any field and, and be good at everything. Now a good example of that is the list that just won the ITC and the list that um, the same list that won the LVO. Now an almost carbon copy of that list is what won uh, CanCon this year. And there were Eldar lists that were kind of built with the mission structure in mind and they were built to be able to kind of handle whatever they came up against. And so that's a list that had a, a max unit of guardians for bubble uh, and uh, ranges for bubble wrap and uh, area denial. They had uh, transports to be dynamic and move around the field. They had heavy hitting units like Dark Reapers. They had melee threats and counterpunch units in Shining Spears. And then they had synergies added to just add layers of depth and layers of complexity and to take those units past their capacities. So that's, that's a great example of an all comers list. A skewed list is kind of a list that um, creates an environment where a single type of unit or mode of attack defense becomes overwhelming or more powerful than otherwise appears. So an example of this is quad knights. So what they're bringing to the table is hopefully uh, more strength eight, so more toughness eight than you can handle, and an overwhelming amount of strength six fire or strength eight fire or an overwhelming amount of melee where they can just walk up and stomp you. Um, the good thing about 8th though at the moment is it's the, the longer it goes, it's favoring all comers lists more and more than skewed. The beginning of 8th edition was all about skew, all about taking as much of the broken thing as you can because it creates um, an environment where your opponent can't win or they can't contend. And uh, big big examples of that would be Storm Raven spams or Razor Wings. So Razor Wings, they created an environment where it was actually impossible for you to kill all these units in uh, six turns you actually just literally did not have enough shots to kill this amount of th these amount of models storm ravens you could not survive long enough against this amount of firepower to win the game so now with eighth and the longer eighth goes obsec is becoming more important stratagems and stratagem management is more important new mission formats are heavily favor all comers lists and um it's kind of just creating diversity in the scene. You can't rely on one unit to do everything. You've got to create lists that have layers. Now, I have no real issue with either style, especially as coming from a guy who played uh, Bane Blades for the last couple of months. But all comers tend to be more fun to play and more fun to play against because you are functioning in more than one uh, phase of the game, which is what skewed lists do. They primarily function in one phase of the game, most commonly shooting, um, but they are combat-based ones as, as well where you will just play that one phase. And maybe you'll have a psychic phase to enhance that slightly, but it won't be a big investment in the psychic phase. And, you know, you'll try and just shoot your opponents off the board. You'll try and take more shots um, than your opponent can reliably shut down. And then your shooting will take away anything that can kill it. And then it takes away everything else. The good thing about what we're going through at the moment is there's no real way to do both. Um, 
So for the advice to players out there, um, decide on which one you want to do and commit to one of them. If you want to play skew, play skew. Don't try and play skew a heavily skewed list and then be all comers at the same time. It doesn't quite work. By default, if you're playing a skewed list, you will always have a hard counter, whereas uh, an all comers list has the ability to, to kind of protect itself from hard counters at the same time. So if you lose one unit, you've got three or four others that do something maybe is quite as good or that can plug the gaps for it. If you're playing four knights and someone brings like I said before, a gorse pylon, <laughs> they deep strike that down. That's a knight dead in that one turn. Pretty much, pretty certain that knight is dead or nearly dead. And when you shoot back, you're probably not going to kill that pylon in one turn. And it's going to shoot again. So as soon as you've lost two of your knights, you've half your army's gone. All of a sudden, you probably lose the ability. Well, firstly, you lose the absolute ability to hold more than two objectives. You can no longer hold three objectives. That's gone. So if it's a five objective mission, you're fucked. Um, unless you also take your opponent down to two units left. So skewed lists work really, really, really well in the first two or three turns of the game. And you have to need to do all your work in those first two or three turns. You need to take away your opponent's ability to score objectives and you need to score yourself. Either that or you need to crush and wipe your opponent off the board that they have no way to contend and come back. So you really need to plan your your tactics and your concept and your army around being good at the start of the game the first couple of turns now all comers um, need to kind of find a faction balance between the ability to score consistently all game and pack enough punch to not get walked over so to break that down for you that is the ability to be on multiple objectives more objectives than your opponent because that's how you win a game you win a game by being on more objectives than your opponent and doing that throughout the game so you need a good amount of units on the board you need more than one threat so one person can't just go oh there's your one big hammer unit i take that away and then you're a toothless dog You've, you can't even fucking hurt me um but also be threatening enough that they can't just wipe out all your unit, little units that are going to win the game for you so now some armies do this better than others, and unfortunately, index armies really struggle to do all comers lists. There aren't many out there that can do it. I think Sisters is probably the only one I can really think of um, who's still working with an index that can do an effective all comers armies. Um, ne the Necron army I saw before is pretty good. I think if I if I had to say the Tau army I did before is kind of askew simply because of the commander spam, but it, it can function in an all comers environment, which is the the strength of that list specifically. Now. Take this into account when you're building your armies, guys. Um, commit to a play style, commit to one of these two types, and work it. Work that style. Um, if you're playing a skew, you know, make sure it hits really hard first two turns, and then you have enough guys to take the board or kill off your opponent's ability to take the board. Um, if you're playing all comers, work on getting your movements down pat and your uh, strategies down pat so that you can effectively move around dynamically. You've got your um, your powerful units and you know what they, they're good at. You've got it in your head, you know, what they're really good at countering. So when you come up against it, you don't have to think for very long or think twice about, you know, what your um, target priority. So yeah, um, find a play style and commit to it. And put in the work to finding the balance or finding an overwhelming unit or, or, or synergy to achieve your outcomes, guys. And more to that, like if you find a style that suits you, back yourself in. Like I said about the um, the Black Legion before, if you find something that suits you to a T and you find a play style that you enjoy, go for it. Like invest in it, invest your time, invest your money, invest your love. Like back yourself in and really, really give it a crack. So now on to closing thoughts for today. Pick a style. Pick style and, you know, pick units that you love. Because, like I said before, if, you pick, if you're playing an army you love, it doesn't matter if you get the crap beaten out of you. You're not going to hate it as much as if you go and take a bunch of units you don't like, play an army you don't enjoy, and then get beaten anyway. <laughs> You'll hate yourself even more. So, yeah, I've got ARC coming up uh, this weekend, so I'll be giving you guys a full rundown of how I did. I may or might not, may not go through games game by game. I might just go through some highlights and some um, really exciting things that happened. I'm going to be uh, doing some interviews with the rest of the Hive City Hobby team, and um, I'll hopefully we'll be putting those up there. I'll be putting some questions to them, and I'll be chucking them up so you guys get to know um, my, my mates and the guys who inspire me. Um, so yeah, I've set my goals for this year. I want to get a podium. I want to end um, high up there on the, the Space Marines uh, ranks, which is a 
big deal because that's a really big pond a lot of space Marine players out there and yeah hope i was helpful to all those uh people who sent in lists and if you've got one or something you, you want to ask me feel free to write in guys would love to hear them so yeah that's it um thanks for listening guys and i'll talk to you again soon